I am the least uh, educated in these areas, um, so I am thrilled to be here to learn from all of you. Um, so I'm welcoming you to the city of Cambridge. I'm, uh, as Jonathan said, I'm a city councilor, but I'm also an architect urban designer. And I'm someone that builds neighborhoods, builds communities. And so my heart is with you for obvious reasons, to invest in life and not in death. Uh, Cambridge and MIT have played important roles in the push for nuclear disarmament. You all know that. Cambridge is the home to mass peace action, which recently celebrated its 60th anniversary, which means I was 10 years old when mass peace action began. It's also the home to, to the Union of Concerned Scientists and the original home of Juan women's action for nuclear disarmament. MIT physicists were key players in the development of nuclear weapons freeze campaign in the 1980s. And I'm happy to say the Cambridge City Council was the first to pass don't bank on the bomb resolution in the country. And this is work that I hope to continue. And part of the reason is, um, when I taught back in the 70s at Harvard, um, my co-director of a program and I went out to dinner, and, and Hiro, that's his name, H-I-R-O, and I were friends, but we never had a one-on-one -on -one talk, and we're having dinner, and I said, Hiro, I, you know, I don't know where you grew up in Japan, and he said, Hiroshima. And it seemed like an eternity, and I said, well, wait a minute, you're older than me, uh, were you there? And he said yes, he was four years old. He, his sister, and his mother were out in the country, uh, four miles out, when the bomb went off, and in that instance, he lost eight brothers and sisters, lost the family business, lost his father. And the amazing thing about Hero is you couldn't find a nicer, caring person in this world who also is an urban designer. Um, and it just reawakened everything I had studied in college and feared. And then when I met Jonathan and Cole and Sheila at Mass Peace Action, it all just came back to me. And that's why I'm here today, and that's why, like you, I care enormously. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of my friends and one of the people I learn from all the time, Jonathan King. Thank you, Dennis. I'll tell you, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to you know, actually be represented uh, in the halls of government by, by true friends. So uh, many of our friends and neighbors have, you know, have long hoped that uh, decades have passed since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that they hoping that the, that would mean the slow demise of the risk of nuclear war. But as everybody here knows, with the election of our new president, rattling nuclear weapons sabers, and then confronted by the North Koreans doing, doing the same thing, uh, the situation has changed. Uh, with very sharp increase in tension. In the course of that uh, North Korean tension, the Congress suddenly and quietly raised the budget caps and added $80 billion to the, um, to the defense budget, biggest peacetime increase in Pentagon spending in, uh, in decades, uh, to more than half, half of all our income taxes dollars now go uh, to, the, to uh, the Pentagon. But what was it, six weeks ago, the Olympic truce was declared in, in the Koreas, right? The North Korean women and the hockey players and South Korean women joined together. Looked like there was a ray of hope, sunshine on the horizon. Talks were arranged. The talks are still set, set to go. But sadly, was it two weeks ago, President Trump announced the appointment of Super Hawks John Bolton and Mike Pompeo, Pompeo as defense advisors. Uh, and these people really are Super Hawks. I spent 
10 years of my life working with many of my biological colleagues on the Biological Weapons Convention, um, which all the countries in the world have signed. And then when the steps would need to be taken for implementation and checkup, which all, everybody was for, John Bolton in, intervened and sabotaged it in Geneva and then sabotaged it in the United Nations and then in, in the US. Well, so it's a different, different environment than some of us expected. At last year's uh, conference on uh, reducing the danger of nuclear war, uh, which some of you attended, we concluded that just educating each other um, it wasn't enough. And we noted the demise of anti-war groups on US college campuses. When, when I was a student, there wasn't a campus in the country that didn't have uh, a, a, a peace groups. Uh, and I spent some time on some, some leading right-wing campuses in the United States, and they had uh, anti-war war groups. That's gone almost, almost ev everywhere. Um, some years ago, Mass Peace Action and New York State Peace Action uh, decided to move on, on that uh, and st started rebuilding on campuses. And we decided this conference, we should use this year's conference to try to focus on rebuilding campus uh, justice and peace groups. That's why we decided on the title, Invest in Minds, Not Missiles, because we thought we we're going to talk about the fact that federal funds are very important for higher e education. Um, with the change in the national situation, we ended up kind of pulling back. We don't have a whole lot of talks about the economics of, of education. Uh, pretty much everybody on the coordinating committee felt like we, we have to deal with this immediate the danger. So we, we have retreated a little bit to focus on how can we prevent uh, you know, another nuclear holocaust. Now, um, you know, a lot of people help in conferences like, like this. A particular thanks are due to MIT Radius, which is an arm of the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts at, at MIT, and Trish Weinman, who refused to come in to show her face, but is absolutely key key person uh, in this, uh, and her assistant, Christina English, my own administrative assistant, Cindy, Cindy Woolley, at Peace Action, Cole Harrison, and Michelle Kunha, and uh, Alexander Plowden, who was a UMass Amherst intern. Uh, the Nuclear Disarmament Working Group of Peace Action, many of the members are here doing things like staffing the registration tables. Uh, Jim Hall here is the timer. Uh, and uh, and the, many of the people will be in the workshop. They deserve thanks. And all the speakers who are speaking pro bono and not taking honorarium. And then we had uh, financial support from the Plowshares Foundation to help bring the students, uh, and from the Amy Rugel Foundation to help feed them. Uh, <laughs> now, um, uh, it, it, it is, some people think it's odd that at MIT there's a strong nuclear disarmament uh, component because MIT was the first or second leading weapons contractor, weapons research contractor in the country for, for 30 years. But many people don't know that when the Manhattan Project wound down, the group of physicists from the Manhattan Project who came to MIT were the ones who thought that dropping the bomb was, was a mistake. And so they established this kind of strong nuclear disarmament presence at MIT. Philip Morrison, Vicki Weisskopf, Henry Kendall, who founded the Union of Concerned Scientists, Randy Forsberg, author of the Freeze Campaign, Bernard Feld, who was the founding editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientist, Vera Kistiakowski, Costa Sippis, George Rashen, Aaron Bernstein, still with us, still fighting. Uh, and then there were a group of, of non-physicists who were kind of lower on the pecking order there. We arranged the rooms and put up the signs. Um, uh, but uh, that group, David Baltimore, Ethan Cigna, Cigna, Salvador Luria, very important in the general anti-war thrust, which uh, at MIT was the site of the scientist strike for peace, also kind of very important historically. So we haven't given up, uh, and we're still here, and we see no reason why there shouldn't be similar events happening uh, in other places. Now, um, we have students here from about 14 New England uh, campuses, uh, which we're very, very excited about. Uh, and uh, 
you'll be meeting, hearing from some of them, meeting through some of the day. Students will caucus on their own on um, Sunday morning. It's not that they don't mind listening to the old folks, but they don't, they do mind continuously uh, listening. So we, we have it, uh, we have it broke, broken up. Um, now, shape of this conference, we have the two morning plenaries, coffee break and a bathroom break between the plenaries. Then you get a, a lunchbox and go to a workshop and introduce each other while you're starting lunch and then the workshop programs will start. Uh, and then we'll come back here for the afternoon plenaries which are really about political mobilization and, and what can be done and what, what, we, all, uh, uh, what we all can do. Um, you know, um, it is difficult to understand the insanity of nations maintaining thousands of nuclear weapons, far more destructive power than could uh, have you. Then, you know, you need to annihilate the whole whole planet, every living every living creature. But that's what's going on in, in the world. It's like the biggest boondoggle in human history, right? No function, no role, doesn't doesn't do anything uh, for us. But it drains drains our economy. Uh, but there's no doubt that these folks are. Um, Embedded, the industry is one of the most profitable sectors of the U.S. industry, of U.S. corporations, which we're going to hear about, uh, hear more about th this morning. So it's going to take all our creativity um, and imagination to kind of figure out how to launch the counter campaign, uh, some of the very imaginative campaigns which tackle directly the, the business of making nuclear weapons, don't bank on the bomb, and... Uh, the divestment, the code pink divestment campaign we're going to hear about uh, today, I think they're very important initiatives. So uh, our opening panelist is Aaron Bernstein. Aaron Bernstein, longtime professor of physics at MIT, member of the board of the Council for a Livable World and uh, leading light in trying to convince other physicists that when they teach about fission and fusion, they should actually mention what happens when it actually happens in, in, in the world. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to deviate from the written things because Jonathan mentioned a few themes. So I have, I have to start with the original thought of many, perhaps most, of the atomic scientists who made the bomb. And first, there was the famous statement from I.I. Robbie. First, we were afraid that Hitler would get the bomb. Then we were afraid that we would get it. And that was quite prophetic. And Jonathan mentioned Victor Weisskopf and the veterans of the Manhattan Project, like Phil Morrison whose knees I sat upon. So I'm the next generation. Um, and these were close friends and mentors to me. And as I said, the, the original feeling of many of the physicists who made the bomb was that this was a common problem that mankind had to be, mankind as a whole had to solve. And the politicians, and these included FDR and Churchill, Stalin, of course, saw the bomb as an instrument of national power and raw national power. And then we get to Mr. Trump, who said, in the beginning, when he was first pondering, uh, not real estate deals, but international issues, asked plaintively, what good are nuclear weapons if you can't use them? So I'll leave you with that thought, because the threat of their use is destabilizing. The fact that they exist is destabilizing. And there's one stable solution, that's zero. And I think one should always keep that in mind. 
It's, it's, it's the only way that people, that will prevent people from threatening their neighbors. Okay, that, and the threat of conventional war is serious enough because if you think of a conventional war and the firepower that one has, uh, let me just give one example. North Korea's nuclear weapons has raised alarm. The, the existence of these weapons with delivery systems that have relatively long ranges. But the South Koreans have been living with tens of thousands of North Korean missiles massed just north of the so-called DMZ, the demilitarized zone. And they've gone about their lives uh, seemingly unaffected by this. Be because this power, the power to launch even conventional weapons in that case would be the end of the regime and the end of the Kim dynasty. Their primary motive in life is the preservation of that dynasty. So they are inhibited by the use of their conventional weapons of which they have enormous superiority. So one has to keep that in mind, what their real motives are, whatever the rhetoric is. Keep in mind the underlying ideas and principles. That's one of the reasons we have launched a nuclear weapons education project. Uh, one of the most active people in that is Louisa Knausis. She's in the audience someplace. Thank you. Uh, I'm proud to have been her teacher and her student, her colleague and student. Um, look, education is very important. I know it's long range. It doesn't address the issue of John Bolton but it's the fundamental material that we have, our brains, our sense of history, and our knowledge of the principles and the past. Those are the things that I think are the long range, the antidote for this kind of militarism, okay? So let me get, let me quickly get to my talk. I, I've, I'm sorry I couldn't help it. <laughs> it was an outburst of emotion. Um, look, nobody wants a nuclear war. Everyone realize that it's suicide, and yet we have these things, and we threaten to use them. And again, I come back to Trump's remark, what good are they if you can't use them? So, and we can't use them, not for moral reasons. It is immoral to use them. Of, of course, they're the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. I always say they kill people independent of race, national origin, anything, religious beliefs, non-beliefs, whatever, they'll kill you if you get in their way. And they'll kill you at long distances through nuclear winter if you launch enough of them. I don't have to tell this audience all of that. But, so the primary way that we're going to have a nuclear war or exchange 
is by accident, since nobody wants it. And that's the thing that we have to guard against. The talk about using them is destabilizing. And their existence, and people always talk about the numbers. I think the numbers are far less relevant. They talk about the numbers coming down. What's relevant is the deployment mode. Um, and the crucial thing is that both the US and Russia have 900 weapons on hair trigger alert. That is, launch on warning. Those are the buzzwords. And the difference between the physical posture of launch on warning as opposed to launch after an explosion is that you can also launch an aggressive first strike. The physical difference in the way the forces are deployed, there, are, there is none. And that's the crucial thing. So you see a blip on a screen someplace, and you say, oh my gods, the missiles are coming. And we've been saved by luck and by specific individuals a number of times. There's a book by Eric Schlosser, Command and Control, which goes through in detail many of these. I, I don't have time or desire to do that, but we've been saved by luck and by humanity of a few individuals on many occasions. And the Cuban Missile Crisis was the most dramatic of these. So what I want to talk about and leave you with is, in my view, citizen education and education of students who will become citizens and become the leaders is the crucial thing. And that's what we're working on in the Nuclear Weapons Education Project. OK, and I invite anyone who's interested to contact me afterwards, or contact Louisa. Okay, thank you. Thank you.